A very good morning to all of you. I welcome you all to Bajra IAS Academy. Today is 10th July 2023. Today we have very important articles for our exam preparation. We will look into old articles. So let's start with the quotation of the day. The quotation for the day is opportunities don't happen, you create them. See guys, in our lives, we many times will wait for the opportunities and wait for the time to come because we people we, we, we people have belief on the particular time and particular opportunity. But the real thing we all should realize is it is not the particular time or opportunity we should wait for. It We should wait for our capacity to improve. We should create our capacity according to that. We should create the opportunities, whatever we need. We should not wait for the any proper time for any work. Because the correct time for to do any work is, it is right now. So don't wait for any opportunities, just create it. This is the yesterday's question. Which among the following steps is most likely to be taken at the time of an economic recession? Option A, cut in the tax rate accompanied by increasing interest rate. Option B, increase in expenditure on public projects. Option C, increase in tax rates accompanied by reduction of interest rate. Option D, reduction of expenditure on public projects. See guys, in this question, the, the situation is economic recession. What happens in the economic recession? Many people don't produce much, so because of this, our GDP become the, uh, become very low and it get into the negative negative growth. So, because our GDP entering into the negative region, it is called the economic recession. How can we improve our GDP to increase? Uh, to improve our GDP, we should increase our production. To increase our production, we need to increase the producers to produce more. How the producers will be increased? To increase the producers, you should give the uh, credit at the very low interest rate. By giving the low credit, you can improve, uh, you can actually, what do you say, you motivate the producers to produce more. So, the option for this, uh, the answer for this question is, option C, increase in tax rate accompanied by reduction in interest rate. So, because of this, what will happen? You are trying to give loans at the low interest rate by getting that loans they will produce more goods because of these more goods automatically the gdp will increase but ultimately what happens it it may lead to the inflation to overcome the inflation we need to ensure that we collect the more tax from the uh, those people who possess the more power so more money if we improve the tax rates automatically the money will in the people's hand will be uh, collected towards the government so because of this what will happen uh, we are ultimately achieving both increasing the production and also we are decreasing the inflation so the answer for this question is option c what is today's question the money multiplier in an economy increases with which one of the following option a increase in the cash reserve ratio in the banks option b increase in statutory liquidity ratio in the banks option c increase in the banking habit of the people Option D, increase in the population of the country. You people try to give answer in the comment section. I will give you the answer in the tomorrow's discussion. These are the articles today we are going to this. We are going to discuss. First article is poorest bill goes unchanged. And you all know guys, our parliament is trying to change the uh, amend the Forest Conservation Act 1918. Uh, so to overlook these procedures, we created the Joint Parliamentary Committee. Joint Parliamentary Committee has given the node or uh, what do you say, it has given the clearance to this bill. So, we will look into the important provisions of this bill and also some challenges regarding this bill. Uh, we will look at this in this article in a vivid manner. And the second article is restoring WTO's crone cell. Uh, we all know guys, WTO have the uh, judicial mechanism. In the WTO, we have the dispute tribunals and also the appellate tribunal. Uh, in the, the this appellate tribunal, it is famously called as the Crown Jail. We will look into this article why the appellate tribunal has been stopped for a while and how this got resurrected in the uh, in the present days. Okay, guys. And the third article is bad loans at record record low. <coughs> what is good loan or bad loan? If something gives you the uh, proper earnings for a bank, then it is the good loan. Uh, if it regularly earns the interest, it is the good loan. 
if some loan fail to attract or fail to give you the um, interest, then it is called bad loan. So, so we will look into this article how our NPS non performing assets has decreasing in recent days. And the fourth article is Design Education in India. So, guys, we have different sectors like engineering, civil engineering, chemical engineering. Likewise, there is also a sector which is called the design. Designing uh, in India, we lack lack in the design education. We will look into the importance of design education and also uh, the importance of design education in India. And this article is impact of pandemic on education. Recently, Ministry of Education has released the performance grading index, uh, district wise data. In this, uh, in this data, we will see how the pandemic has impacted the outcome of education in different districts. And the last article is global tropical primary forest cover continued to decline and abated in 2022. Now, you all know guys, we have a certain target of uh, uh, stopping the deforestation by 2030 and also we ensure that we will afforest, afforestation, we will do afforestation for nearly 320 million hectare by 2030. In this article, the global forest, uh, the global, sorry, the uh, global forest watch as this is an organization, Global Forest Watch. They are given report. In this report, they are saying our global forests are declining very ferociously. We want to look into this issue. Uh, we will explain this article in a very vivid manner. Okay, guys, without wasting time, let's move into the first article. Objections overruled forest bill goes to the house unchanged. You all know, guys, we have the Forest Conservation Act 1980 and the government is trying to change the or amend the provisions in the Forest Conservation Act. So because of this many oppositions has raised, many challenges are raised. So to overcome the challenges and to give the uh, overall examination examination of the bill, they created the Joint Parliamentary Committee. You all know guys, whenever we create Joint Parliamentary Committee, we will include both Lok Sabha members and the Rajya Sabha members. It may or might compose of nearly 31 members. Okay guys. And what are the amendments proposed in this new amendment bill? Actually, they are trying to change some provisions in the Forest Conservation Act 1980. Uh, they, oh, the, they want to ensure that our forest land is not banned only reserved for non-forestry uses. You all know guys, whenever we convert some forestry land for the non-forestry purposes, uh, whoever changing this forestry land into non-forestry land, they will contribute some paisa which will be collected as a camp farm, that compensatory afforestation, uh, com compensatory afforestation fund act. Under this, we will collect this money and we will try to ensure the afforestation in the other place uh, for the same amount of afforestation. Okay, this is the procedure going on, but uh, with the recent amendment, the government is trying to do some changes with the bill, we will look into it. What are the proposed amendments? See guys, you all know we have the border area, land land border is near about 15,000 uh, 15, kilometer, coastal border is about 7,500 kilometer. And also you know we have near, near about 4,000 kilometer border with the China. Uh, and you also know that China is developing or creating good infrastructure in its border. In case of Indian Army, we don't have the good infrastructure to overcome challenges. So, to ensure the good border security, India needs to yeah, enhance its infrastructure in the border areas. So, the new Forest Amendment Act is trying to give permission for the infrastructure development in the border areas up to 100 km inside the border area. Are you all getting this? Yes, this is the context. So, to create infrastructure within the 100 kilometers in the border areas, we do, they don't want any forest clearances. Okay, guys. So, this is the provision. But the challenge point, what they are saying is, it is generic and deeply problematic. Because you all know we have forest areas in the border areas. If we give 100 kilometers, it seems like a, it is a very umbrella term. There is no proper definition which area. There is no proper definition which area may be converted or which area will be cut down. So, this is this seems to be very generic and deeply problematic. And the second provision is name change. Actually, we are trying to change that Forest Conservation Act into somewhat in the Hindi name like one Sanrakshan Yavam Samvardhan Adiniyam. 
this translation is it is uh, it is in english we call it as forest conservation and augmentation act uh, what the challenge point is raising here they are saying that name is not so inclusive because uh, you see uh, this uh, this name is in hindi so it is not inclusive it is it is uh, leaving out the south india on the northeastern india so for this question our government has replied that forest conservation is much more than the clearances they want they want to enforce on the conservation process not on the clearances process okay guys and uh, the government is more concerned about they want to remove the ambiguities and bring clarity about the applicability of the act uh, you all know guys forest conservation act 1980 mostly prescribes that they do they want to conserve the forest so they propose the umbrella term uh, the forest should not be cleared but in the new amendment they are making some clarity like uh, this area will can be converted this area cannot be converted are you getting me guys see you consider a 100 km has a forest area 100 km has a forest area in this forest area 100 square km of forest area uh, if we see the 1980 forest act it says we should conserve this forest okay guys but the amendment is trying to change the provision that in this 100 square km of forest area 15 km this 15 km it can be converted this 15 km can be converted for tourism this 15 km can be converted for other infrastructure purpose so what the change we are seeing here they are creating the clarity over the forest area which can be converted which cannot be converted so uh, are you all getting me guys so they are creating the some clarity they are trying to remove the ambiguities so what will happen it will ultimately attract the investors it will also ensure the forest area is conserved core area will not, may not be or will not be disturbed the other peripheral area which possess the less tree cover can be converted into the infrastructure areas okay guys and what the other proposed amendments they remove restriction on creating infrastructure that would aid national security and create livelihood opportunities for those living on the periphery of forest okay so now what the challenge arises from this point actually the challenge point is uh the central government is acting unilaterally to take decision over this they actually we don't have any clear cut definition for national security so in the name of national security they will allow the infrastructure project in the forest area so uh, actually this uh, this provision it seems to be we are giving the more unilateral power to the central government ultimately it will affect the forest so this is the challenge point they arise from the opposition side the predominant idea of the proposed changes why the government is trying to change this actually the proposed idea has some objective behind this they want to ensure that they want to increase the forest cover and also along with the increase in forest cover they want to ensure carbon stock has been increased in the form of forest okay guys because we have committed in the united nation so we want to ensure our carbon stock has been increasing and also they want to attract the infrastructure uh, investors and the developers to attract the developers we need some clarity over the trans uh, clarity over land agreements forest agreements then only we can attract the developers so to make land available to the developers and to make the legal obligation and to meet the legal obligations we need some clear and clarity procedures so because of this only we are trying to change some provisions and also what is the other objectives behind this we want to ensure uh, that applicability of forest conservation act become the clear cut and also we want to free up the land for the unrecorded the forest okay see guys we, in the forest area not all area is important there is a, some core zone which will be very important and there there may be some peripheral zone this may be not so important for the forest conservation so this area can be converted for any other tourism purposes or any other purposes so uh, with these new changes the government is trying to bring some clarity over the forest areas to attract the both investor and also they want to balance with the forest and ecosystem management okay guys 
and what are the other objections and concerns raised from the opposition party they are saying that government a central government possesses the unilateral power they can take away the land for the defense purposes and also there are certain environmental groups they are also saying there is no clear definition for the deemed forest because deemed forest means they are seem to be a forest or they may become a forest in the future area uh, the go central government is investing itself a power to convert the deemed forest into the uh, infrastructure projects so this is creating a problem because we don't have any clear cut definition for the deemed forest deemed forest this will ultimately compromise with the integrity of the government okay guys the proposed exemptions leave a lot to the center to decide retrospectively center has the power to decide retrospectively so it is giving giving the center the unilateral power and what they are saying uh the other argument is this may seem like a double whammy uh, it's like a double edged sword losing a unrecorded forest areas and also recorded forest area to the project so it will ultimately affect both the recorded and un unrecorded forest area so these are the certain challenges or concerns raised by the opposition members okay guys so the first uh, first article is all about this only guys actually it is not the editorial article it is news article given in the newspaper it seems to be very important for our exam preparation so i kept this article in the first of our discussion uh in regarding this definitely we will get many news editorial articles in future we will also discuss that in the future okay let's move into the another article restoring the world trade organizations cronzel the cronzel you all know this world trade organization wto which was first created in in the name of agreement general trade on uh general general agreement on trade and tariff in 1948 and after that in 1995 this gatt agreement has been converted into an organization which got named as world trade organization under this world trade organization they will conduct a uh, regular annual meeting or the bi annual meeting uh, during this mostly they conduct bi annual meeting so uh, based on this bi annual meeting the world leaders will come together and they will agree on the trade related problems whenever any country faces any problem this world trade organization have the dispute redressal mechanism under this they have certain dispute redressal tribunal whenever uh, there is no amicable solution uh, with the dispute redressal mechanism we will go for the appeal so there is an appellate tribunal in the world trade organization so what happened with this appellate tribunal during 2019 up to 19, uh, 2019 it was working properly uh, they tried to solve many problems even they tried to give judgment against the us and europe union so basically the world trade organizations appellate tribunal was very good successful in its mandate they tried to enforce the international law over all the countries without any impartiality okay without any partiality okay guys so what happened after 2019 the us was not feeling comfortable with this appellate body because us have some problem it feels like the appellate body of world trade organization is imposing the binding order on the usa so because of that usa is losing something in the world trade so usa unilaterally tried to stop the appointment of its appellate tribunal members are you getting this so what happened after 2019 from 2019 to 2022 we don't have any appellate tribunal so it become like a toothless saw toothless saw so because of uh, so after 3 years now all countries are trying to cooperate together to create the appellate tribunal they are trying to resurrect the appellate tribunal in the world trade organization so this is the context of this news case uh, this appellate tribunal is famously called as the crown jail since 2019 the dispute settlement system remain 
paralyzed how because because of the united states it unilaterally blocked the appointment of its members actually why it all happened it all happened because the appellate body become victim of its success it got more success in the past judgments it give uh, it holds the powerful countries such as us and the eu accountable for international law breaches so because of this what happened this u e us and the eu uh, come the antagonistic towards the appellate body so ultimately they don't want to appoint their appellate tribunal so because of this in 2019 the dispute settlement system got paralyzed what is the major agree, uh, argument given by the united states united states is feeling that the dispute settlement system or the appellate tribunal or appellate body in the world trade organization is trying to have a judicial over reach and they are exceeding the institutional mandate actually guys when we created the world trade organization there was an agreement that agreement is called a uh, dispute settlement understanding under this dispute settlement understanding it is made clear that we should not create any precedent uh, order we should not emphasize on the precedent order you see guys um, world trade organization may have witnessed any problem with the any country in the past days so at that past days they may have given certain judgment so again in the present days if we get any problem same like the past problem we should not look into the past judgment because the case scenario the time scenario of the past judgment may be different so in the understanding of the dispute settlement in the wto it has been made clear that we should not look into the precedent we should look into the case in a fresh and uh, very fresh manner we should not look into the precedent judgment but what happened in most of the cases the appellate tribunal has looked into the precedent and gave the judgment same as like a precedent uh, as the past judgment in the present days also so this has become a challenge for the usa usa cannot uh, not getting the any benefit from the appellate tribunal's judgment so because of all this judicial overreach and its institutional uh, institutional mandate ex exceeding power the usa got some negative impact over its trade and also the usa is saying the rules are not clearly well defined for the appellate tribunal and the dispute settlement mechanism so until and unless the rules are clearly defined usa will not let the anyone to be joined in the appellate tribunal are you all getting me guys yes and they are also creating the binding precedent this goes against the spirit of wto when we created the wto Uh, we have the dispute settlement understanding this dispute settlement understanding has emphasized that uh, we should not use the binding precedent but uh, the same uh, dispute settlement understanding has also emphasized that this appellate tribunal has the authority to uh, infer the laws international laws regarding the wto so there is a two different provisions are the different uh, sections in this dispute settlement understanding the first one is the first one states that the dispute settlement system should not use the precedent as the binding uh, or judgment and the second one is the dispute settlement system has the authority to infer or decipher the previous judgment so there is a conflict statements in this understanding so the usa is, is saying here they want everything to be made clear whether the dispute settlement uh, dispute settlement authority has the power to infer the uh, infer the past judgment whether the uh, dus as uh, dsu has the power to make the president has binding or not so these are the arguments created by the united states what is the need of the r we need to find the balance between the overall spirit of multilateralism 
and we want to ensure that all these mandata are written down properly and also uh, we should clarify that appellate body has a cogent reasons they, if they are making the previous ruling has a binding one there should be a strong reason for that and also uh, what happened the wto member countries all should come together to create the appellate tribunal and they should also ensure that they should not they do not create the precedent for themselves okay guys it seems that usa's larger plan is dejudicialization of trade multilateralism actually guys uh, by giving the major problems the author has tried to give the solution for the problems and also the author has tried to give the other side of the problem you see guys uh, the usa have some problem with the judicial mechanism of wto and the the process can be defined in a single term that is dejudicialization of trade multilateralism what is this dejudicialization first let's understand what is judicialization you all know guys we have international legislation so we have different international organizations like uh, international court of justice inter uh, in fact we can say the united nations unfccc these are like international organization these organizations create a law this process can be famously called as international legislation same like that we have international judicialization what does it mean international judicialization means we have certain judicial international bodies who impose or who try to give law over other countries we have international court of justice international criminal court so these are different judiciaries which which encompass over all over the world so this is the international judicialization now what the america is what the us is saying this international judicialization somewhat seems to be affecting the sovereignty of other nation in the name of international interest they are trying to infringe infringe upon the autonomy of other independent sovereign nation so what the us needed right now the us needed they want to ensure that this judicialization of international relation should be dejudicialized see this word is very important dejudicialization of trade multilateralism uh, you all know guys wto has been created after the end of cold war and also the the end of the uh, collapse of communism so the author is trying saying here it is the child of that time and it is the evil of right now so because when we created the wto the demand of wto the demand of this institution was different their mandate was different but the world has evolved now it is moving towards the multilateralism at the time it was unilateral after the end of cold war but right now we have in the multilateral so different countries possess the different objectives and different perspectives so this judicialization should uh, this ju judicialization of international trade should be dejudicialized and also they are saying that market is ultimately determined by the invisible and uh, invisible hands demand and the supply the, you all know guys you all know this uh, adam smith has said that we have invisible hands in the market that is demand and supply but the ernst ulrich has said there is an visible visible hand in the market that is the wto law this visible hand will make sure the demand and supply are maintained in the market but what this wto the visible hand is doing here uh, the author is saying this visible hand of wto is ultimately affecting the sovereignty of the nation because they are taking the control over the critical decisions of the other countries see you all know wto has provisions to reduce the tariff tariff barrier non tariff barrier and other provisions to make other countries accountable for the international laws 
but these international laws are ultimately affecting the sovereignty and the autonomy of particular nation okay guys so these are the arguments regarding the wto and i have already explained to you what is dejudicialization dejudicialization means reverse phenomena they don't want to give power to the wto to judicialize upon the country's issue they want to dejudicialize this wto mechanism why the us is pushing for dejudicialization because you all know guys us is uh, the problem or fight with the china has been increasing so to overcome the china usa need some freedom with the wto's restriction usa cannot challenge the raising china so they want the uwto to be dejudicialized for the geopolitical or geoeconomic reason and also they need the full power of trade policies for itself so so they need autonomy in its trade policies to achieve these objectives the usa want dejudicialization of trade multilateralism let's move into the another article guys bad loans at the record low but right off still in the mix okay guys first let's understand what is bad loans and what is good loan what is good loan whenever when bank gives loan to someone if that loans ends the bank so you consider this as a bank and this as the person who acquired the loan from the bank when the bank give loan to the customer customer will regularly pay interest and after some time along with the interest they will pay the whole premium amount so what happened this loan given by the bank to the customer has is a very good asset for a bank when we call this as a good loan uh, when the customer regularly pays the interest to the bank then it is the good loan then what is the bad loan when the customer failed to give the interest to the bank then it becomes the bad loan in the technical aspect we call it as non performing asset when the customer failed to pay interest for minimum 3 months for the last 3 months if the customer failed to pay the interest then we call this loan as a non performing asset after a non performing asset if the non performing asset category is maintained for 12 months if the customer is not paying uh, rent or the interest for the 12 months then we call this npa as a substandard asset if the loan is maintained in the substandard asset category for the 12 other to um more 12 months for see for the first 3 months it will be converted into npa and after if the N, uh, in the npa category if it is continued for the 12 months we call it as a substandard category and for the next 12 months this will be considered as a doubtful asset okay guys after getting into the doubtful asset if the bank recognize this this may not become a this may not become a, a recover, recoverable loan then they will call it as a loss asset after calling it as loss asset when they try to do audit and they find it is impossible to recover that loan they will write off that loan what is this write off they will take off this loan account from the balance sheet itself okay are you all getting me guys so ab kya hoga the loan which was given to the consumer will not be added net to the account books it will seem like the account book has become so clear it is the write off okay guys let's move into the article what they are saying see guys for the past 4 years we have been having the very high percentage of bad loans if we have given the 100 rupees has loan in this near about 10 rupees 10 rupees loan was was acting as a bad loans for the past 10 years but this bad loan has been decreasing in the last last one year okay guys see this uh, a chart clearly guys this is the gross non performing asset and it is the net non performing asset the gross non performing asset has reduced to the level of 3.9 percentage and the not net non performing asset has reduced to the level of 1 percentage just 1 percentage so this is the very good achievement in our economy guys 
the second quarter of 2019 the npa ratio of indian banks was 9.2 percentage that means if we give 10 loans in this 10 loans one loan was non performing asset so in the in the 10 loans one loan become the barrier for the banks between the 2016 and 2019 the npa ratio remained high it began to decline later and continued to do so even during the pandemic are you getting me guys during the pandemic we have a given some moratorium period for all the loan holders because of this moratorium period also we get we got some impact in the non performing asset but what the author is saying between 2016 and 2019 we had a high nps but with the recent trend the nps has been decreasing significantly what help could the banks to overcome the npa problem the first one is the insolvency bankruptcy code so because of this insolvency and bankruptcy code the recovery of bad loans the recovery of non performing assets has been streamlined or strengthened and fastened so because of this bad loan recovery has been has been becoming very good for the banks and also the banks stopped lending to give big money to industries if they give huge or lump sum amount to some industries it it is very difficult to recover that money so the bank has changed the strategy they don't give very big amount they give only small amounts to the industries and also the banks also try to increase their share of personal loans they don't want to give industrial loans and agriculture loan and they don't want to like they don't want to give for the any industrious purposes they are trying to give loans as a personal loans why because personal loans recovery power for the bank is very high there is very less chance to get failure in the personal loan recovery so mostly banks prefer to give personal loans in the past few days so because of all these reasons npas got reduced but there is also concerns with the decrease in the npa what is the concern they are saying that we have given the moratorium period during the covid 19 okay guys so there is no clear cut provision which loan account will be written off or which loan account should be converted into the npa after this end after the end of moratorium period so because of this moratorium period and because wait a minute guys because of this moratorium period because of this moratorium period and the, and the lack of clear cut provision we are not clear which loan has been converted into the npa which loan has been written off okay guys and also there is a concern there is a sudden shift in the portfolio from industries to the personal loan so it is not clear it is not looking clear why the bank has shifted to the personal loan and also there is a fall in nps especially in the financial year 2020 can be largely attributed to the loan write offs basically you all know what what is meant by write offs the banks has uh, cleared their account books by using the write offs if once they take the loans from their uh, by using the write offs it will not be added in the account books so banks mostly preferred to do the write offs why banks prefer to do write offs so you guys when our where a bank possesses a npa in that audit account in its account book if there is some asset which is not performing to the bank so according to its non performing assets they should create some buffer to overcome this future problem uh, if you have 20 rupees as an npa uh, in your total bank account you have given 100 rupees as an loan in that if 20 rupees is acting like a npa to overcome the future problem because of this 20 rupees npa the bank will maintain the buffer that is capital adequacy ratio uh, and some other buffer also uh, some other different buffers also there to overcome this npa problem so for 20 rupees npa they want to give they want to keep for example per se we can say they want to keep 5 rupees as a buffer if the npa reduced to 10 rupees then the buffer can be reduced to 2.5 rupees they don't want to keep more if that 
NPA reduced to 5 rupees, they want to keep just 1 rupee as a buffer. So, by reducing the NPA, they can decrease the buffer, so the capacity of bank to give loan can be enhanced. Are you agreeing me guys? See, if the bank want to create a buffer, the bank will not possess that much money to give credit to other clients. So, if they want to give more credit to the clients, they need more money, they don't want to create a buffer. So, to overcome this buffer problem, they will try to reduce the non-performing asset by giving the more write-offs. Are you all clear guys? Yes. So, there is a concern during the 2020, the banks have tried to give more write-offs. So, because of this only, the NPS has reduced. But, the RBA has given the clear-cut view over this. They are saying, uh, the decline in the NPS of the bank is really a very good indicator of growth in, growth in the economy. Because they are saying the bank's profit has been increasing in the past few days. So, only the NPS, uh, NPS are decreasing. And also, the NPS are decreasing because we are trying to give the personal loans. Personal loans success capacity for the banks in the personal loan is very high. They are, their recovery capacity in the personal loan is very high. So, because of all this aspect, the problem of NPA has been decreasing in the India. And also, according to the latest financial stability report released by the RBI. Remember this report, guys, financial stability report released by the Reserve Bank of India. The recovery of bank is consistent and their health continues to improve. Moratoriums during the COVID-19 did not later lead to a significant bump in the NPS. Okay guys, actually the financial stability report is trying to address the concerns and the challenges raised by the others. Uh, you, uh, we said in the previous slide that moratorium has increased the NPS. But what the RB is saying, because of moratorium, we don't. Uh, we don't <coughs> create any more NPS and also the portfolio change to the personal law, personal loans is also working uh, good for the banks because the personal loans recovery capacity is very good for the banks. But the real fact we all should look is that write-offs write -offs are significantly increasing with the banks. We should consider this as a concern and we should look over it and we should create a correct solution for this write-off problem. Okay, guys. So, this is the article all about design education in India, its origin, challenges and opportunities. You all know, guys, maybe uh, you may have pursued the engineering degree or bachelor in science or any other degree course per se. But... Uh, how many of your friends or how many of your school friends has pursued a degree in design? In India, the design education is not so favorable or not so not so available to the students all over the India. So, because of this, uh, what do you say? Because of low awareness regarding the design education, the design education in India and the availability of designers in India, the skills regarding the design is very low available in India. Are you getting me guys? What is the problem with the design education? If you see for the past 50 years after getting independence, we don't, we didn't create any good institute to impart or to inculcate the design education. Only very few institute possess the curriculum to create the design education. <coughs> uh, in, in case, if you see the private institute, in private institute also, we don't have the design education courses. Only the few universities, Shunadar University, Jindal Global University, and the Flame University, these universities have launched recently, they, they possess the design program. If you see the past few years, other private universities are also trying to give the design education, but the reach of design education in India is very low. For per se, if you see the data, for 100 engineers, we have only one designer. So, these are still only relatively a small number of institutions offering a design education. Even though India have a very big demand for the design education, 
there is only a few institute which is giving the decent education so what happened why the decent education is very low in india because it got a late start if you see the institution which is giving the formal decent education only a few institute like national institute of design and the iit bombay uh, and only the few private institute one it was only one private institute that is srishti which started in 1996 these institutes give the education on design so the, so because of this past late start our design education in india is very low but this trend has been changing since from 2017 the go, uh, why the trend has been changing from 2007 it's not 2017 it is 2007 because the government has adopted the national design policy because of this national design policies uh, they established the india design council in 2009 so because of all this improvement the trend has been changing there has been a more awareness among student to take up the design big demand for the design if you if you see the indian firms indian firms need the more designers they want to create the passionate designers because in india we lack in the skillful designers even though we have very good demand but the demand is not fulfilled in india and full or no forms with the design as a cost core strategy in india most of the industries are not looking for the designers so because of this less demand for designers has attracted very low student in the design education so because of this uh, job opportunity very low job opportunity uh, our students interest towards the design education is is not so good because of job opportunities okay guys if you see the recent trend india's design sector is growing at the rate of 23 to 25 percentage annually and it is creating the accelerated demand for the designers and also it is expected to create a huge demand from the market for a professional designers so th- there is a present trend and there will be a future demand uh, in future definitely we will have a good designer demand so the author is trying to emphasize that we need to create the design education and we sh- we need to overcome these challenges and there is also a supply side shortage shortages guys we are not giving the pra- um what do you say very good practical and formal skill training for the designers in india we don't possess a very good designers so because of the supply side shortages also Uh, the design education in india is has been affected so we need to look upon the both the demand factor and the supply side factor of for the designers and we should overcome these challenges to impart the design education in india to conclude that we can say 2020s could well see a design education take off because we, you all know you all know the trend has been changing the information technology has been increasing so we need the more designers for all industrial products so uh, because of this take off in information technology definitely the design education will give you very good impact or uh, motivation for the other students to join into the design education report highlights the impact of pandemic on education our ministry of education has recently released a report uh, it is called performance grading index based on this performance grading index they try to evaluate the different districts so after giving this performance grading index they are saying the pandemic has affected the outcome of education in various districts we will look into the different indicators in the performance grading index they are trying to uh, they are trying to compartmentalize the different institutes according to the scoring they they create the compartments like a daksh who score the above 90% and who score 91 to 90% they are called utkarsh ati uttam uttam prachesta akanshi so these are the categories uh, what the pgi performance grading index has created uh, what they are saying no no institute in the india uh, no district in india has achieved the daksh and the utkarsh 
and only few institute has achieved the bootkars see guys no institutes has scored the above 90 and the above 80 so because of all uh, so because of that no district has uh, become the daksh or bootkars so most of the institute are uh, coming under the ati uttam and only two institute are come under the akanshi 2 and no institute was included in the akanshi 3 so basically what they are saying because of this pandemic effect the outcome of district education got reduced so only no district has <coughs> secured a place in the butkarsh and the dax region okay guys if you see the objectives of report the main objective is they want to grade the district education by grade by giving the grade for the different district they are trying to evaluate the different districts so that what happens is they try to give transparency and accountability uh, regarding the education so because of this report the, the department of education may look into the shortcomings in their district and they try to overcome this if you see the performance grading index it has the 83 indicators these 83 indicators are categories under the six categories what are the six categories you look into these technical aspects these are not so important for your exam but for the for the sake of information please look into these indicators so let's move into the final article the global tropical primary forest cover continued to decline unabated in 2022 there is a world research institute guys under this world research resources institute we have an organization global forest watch this global forest watch has released a report in this report they are saying we have last year very vast patch of for primary forest what is the primary forest primary forest is those forest land which has been undisturbed for the past many years so it is your fresh land this is a primary forest once we cut the primary forest the other forest develop this this developed forest is called secondary forest so primary forest once we cut it we create a new forest it is the secondary forest now the report is all about the primary forest uh, it is saying that in the world the primary forest has been declining significantly it is also giving the certain region like indonesia malaysia uh, Brazil, Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. So they, they are create. They, it has tried to give the different picture for different countries. Actually, the Brazil and the Democratic Republic of Congo possess the huge and vast land under the primary forest. But what happened with the Brazil because of its president Jair Bolsonaro and their political aspirations they try to convert the amazon basin for the economic purposes so because of this primary forest cover has been reduced and what happened with the um, democratic of republic of congo in democratic of republic democratic republic of congo because of increase in population the forest cover has been decreased significantly so because of population increase and the other reasons the drc lost its primary forest on the other hand if you see the indonesia and malaysia they have managed to conserve their forest in a very good manner okay guys and in case of india we have lost the 43.9 thousand so it's near about 44 thousand hectares of primary forest between the 2021 to 2022 it is like near about 17 percentage of our total countries tree cover lost in this period actually what the author is trying to say here if we want to improve our global tree cover the tree cover loss should be decreased by 10 percent each and every year so that by 2030 we have committed for the uh, international agreement right for 2030 we want to ensure that deforestation has been stopped and we ensure that we will create afforestation of 320 million hectares to achieve this target our deforestation and the decline in the forest cover should be stopped okay guys and what is this final article nlbm3 launch vehicle market you all know guys we are going to launch the chandrayaan 3 mission on july 14th 
by using, using the lbm3 what is this lbm3 lbm3 is a launch vehicle mark 3 it is a type of gsk lv um in in india we have the three types of launch vehicle one is psv gslv and the small satellite launch vehicle psv is uh, polar satellite launch vehicle gslv is geosynchronous launch vehicle and ssv is small satellite launch vehicle our our isro has mostly used the psv so only we consider this psv has a work horse or power horse for the isro the gslv has different varieties the most famous one is launch vehicle mark 3 it has the capacity to launch the 10 tons to the low earth orbit yeah in case of psv we have the uh, four types of launching stages in the gslv we have three launching stages the first launching stage is uh, propelled with the solid what do you say solid propulsion system and in the in the second stage we use the liquid fuel and the third stage we use the cryogenic fuel for the first stage, for the first propulsion we use the hydroxyl terminated polybutadiene and for the liquid fuel we use the asymmetrical dimethyl hydrogen and in the case of cryogenic we use the liquefied hydrogen and liquefied oxygen so this is the Uh, news about the launch vehicle Mark III. After the July 14th, we will get the news regarding the Chandrayaan-3 mission. We will look into this article in a very elaborate manner. So that's it, guys. Thank you so much for listening the whole article. If you like the video, please press the like button. If you want to give me any suggestion, give me in the comment section. We will try to cover your comments. And also, don't forget to touch the subscribe button along with the touch the bell icon button so that you get all notification regarding the videos posted by Bajra IAS Academy. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.